We got Gators Breakdown here. We know we're business. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Coming at you. Reaction review of Florida's 24-13 win over UCF. Once again, good to back to back wins here. Mississippi State, the bye week, and now uh, Central Florida, uh, UCF here, uh, there for the Gators. So, fun time. Uh, night game in the swamp. Uh, pretty electric all day long. A little bit of rain uh, during the tailgate, but I never hurt anybody. So, uh, st- still a pretty good day. Saw uh, lots of people. Thanks for uh, stopping by uh, Harmonic Woods, saying hello, and uh, really enjoyed it. But uh, also enjoyed the game. Uh, thoughts? You know, Florida should win this game. I thought it would be – Maybe a little more of a shootout uh, there for for Florida and and, and, and UCS offenses, but uh, not really. Uh, the Gator offense looked like they might be on their way to doing what I thought they would do, but uh, you know, product their first half, not so much in the second half. But the storyline is the defense. And look, this UCF team isn't that great. Um, another reason I thought Florida should have won this game, uh, and the defense done what we wanted to see them do. What they you know, a Florida defense should do. Um, now we, we know this ain't a championship level team, but at the same time, we knew this defense had something better in it. And I think bye week was certainly, there was a lot of talk. We'll get into that too, about how much better or how everything they were working on and, and fixing some things, but we'd have to go see it. We have to have a result to talk about uh, if those things were going to happen or not. Uh, and they happened. Uh, so we'll, Big picture, who knows what it holds for the rest of the season, but at least on Saturday night in the Swamp, that defense uh, showed up uh, and did what they were supposed to do against uh, an offense that, if you let it, if you let it, can put a lot of, a lot of yards up, especially on the ground, something that we were not very confident in with this Gator defense, but they showed up. So plenty to get into. Hit that like button right here on YouTube if you're watching this live. Thank you, thank you so much. I'll get the comments in just a sec. Uh, in just a second, if you're first time here or haven't done it yet, subscribe right here on Gators Breakdown on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. If you're checking the replay out, and then hey, I'm gonna keep that conversation going. Gators Breakdown Plus, get access to that Discord link is in the description. Good conversation going on there now about the game against UCF last night. I was checking it out before hit live on this episode. If you want to keep those conversations going, you can. Join that Discord as well through Gators Breakdown Plus. Add free episodes of Gators Breakdown available there as well. All right, let's go. Um, and you guys know me. <laughs> Going back to the preview last week where, you know, my message was at like Florida. I mean, don't get me wrong. We know this isn't the Florida we want. The, the one that ends up being a home underdog <laughs> to UCF. But that was the case on Saturday. There weren't a lot of reasons to feel comfortable in picking Florida to win, but I did. Weren't a whole lot of confidence in it, but I felt like Florida should win this game. And it's funny how it happened. I think you asked most Gator fans a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, the way UCF was looking. They had that Colorado game, and it probably helped a bit, given that performance against Colorado, because Colorado, while improved, not a great team by any stretch of the imagination and completely just walked over UCF, that changed the narrative. And fairly, you know, you can adjust along the way. But I still wasn't picking Florida with a whole lot of confidence, but did pick Florida. And no doubt this team worked on things in the bye week. More intense, time to work, more time to work on fundamentals. It was time to identify who needed to play more. And a lot of that goes for the defense. And we heard... Jack Pyburn and Pup Howard and other players all throughout the week talk about the defense and everything they've worked on. And look, talk is cheap. We, we, we know that. We've heard a lot of talk. All those things, even if all those things were true, it was time to see it play out on the field. If all the good that they were saying was happening was true, okay, well, let's just go see it. And in many ways, we saw it against UCF. They said, oh, you know, we had all been beat over the head with how different this team was going to be all offseason, only to get whacked by Miami and Texas A&M. So skepticism was fair. And look, it's only one game, but things did work for Florida against UCF. 
and we'll see how much they mean for you know the rest of the ride. Uh, but it, college football, <laughs> the season looks pretty crazy right now after Saturday. You know, not even you know certainly outside of the Florida game, so many top ten teams losing. We'll see what it means for a, a rest of you know a pretty crazy college football season that it looks like we're about to have. But it was great to see Florida act like the better team, the more talented team, because they are. It was definitely a tell of two halves, you know, for the offense being up 24-3 at halftime. Uh, and the defense, you know, especially up front, showed a physical presence that you know, was going to be needed throughout the night. And they were there all night long. Uh, great seeing them live in the backfield, creating havoc, creating pressure, holding the UCF ground game well, well below the performance so far this season. And we knew that was the storyline. It, was, it wasn't hidden at all. You're playing Gus Malzahn. You see the stats. It's not hard to see what UCF needed to do to win this game. And it's not hard for Florida's defense <laughs> to, to know what's coming. But easier said than done, of course. So the game wasn't perfect by any means, but great to see a win. And while 24 to 13 won't blow anyone away, it was in control for a good majority of the time. You didn't really ever feel like, you know, even with the offense kind of lackadaisical execution lacking. I think you oddly enough felt pretty comfortable about what the defense was showing you all night. UCF just didn't have it. So this was a UCF team that was rushing for an average of 326 yards a game. That was good for second in the country while Florida was giving up 146. That was good for 83rd in the country. Florida gave up 108 yards on the ground. 108 yards to UCF. UCF averaged 326. They gained 108. Their longest rush was 13 yards. They led the country in explosive running plays, if you go back to the preview last week. They had 46 rushing plays of at least 10 yards coming into the game. 46 rushing plays of at least 10 yards. Florida defense only gave up three such runs against the Knights. And then after K.J. Jefferson ate this defense alive last year for Arkansas, his longest rush, his longest rush against Florida Saturday night for UCF was five yards. As he ended the night, 12 rushes for negative 18 yards. Of course, sacks are calculated in that, but that's the havoc. That's the pressure Florida was able to create against UCF. Running back R.J. Harvey, he had 18 explosive rushing plays. That led the Big 12. That's runs over 10 yards. He had only two of those. Only two runs over 10 yards for R.J. Harvey. Had 18 coming into the game. Now look, we talked about it last week, too. Also, you know, needing to look out for UCF hitting those big explosive passing plays. Not an explosive or not a consistent passing attack, but an explosive passing attack. The passing numbers won't mal- you know, they wouldn't wow you by any means. But overall, they hit on six 40-plus yard passing plays. And that was good for 10th in the country. So six passes of at least 40 yards coming into the game. Florida didn't give up one pass over 40 yards. Not one. And for what we've seen with this defense, that bears repeating, not giving up one pass over 40 yards. <laughs> so big, big show up there, too. The three longest were 30, 38, and 35. So almost, almost now. But still, given what we've seen with this defense, the last three years, and this system, and the coaches that have come there, come through there, we've seen the explosive passes. We've seen the easy give-ups. Was it easy for UCF Saturday night? No passes over 40 yards completed for the night. And so you had the 30, 38, and 35-yard passes No other pass went for more than 14 yards. And the next longest was 11 twice. I mean, K.J. Jefferson only completed that off the top of my head. I'll get to the stats in a minute. 12 the whole night? Yeah. 12 completions the whole night. So another struggling aspect for this UCF offense that I brought up last week in the preview. Because, look, we knew Florida was going to have to do some things that UCF was good at. Stop those things. But you also needed to continue the things that they were bad at. Don't let them do something uncharacteristic of themselves and, you know, help them win the game. So they had that struggling aspect. 
when they would get in the red zone. And they'd settle for field goals. Or not score at all. Their touchdown percentage was 60%. That was good for 83rd in the country. So if they got in the red zone, you couldn't let it be any better than that. Well, they had three trips. They had a set of four field goal twice. And then a touchdown. So 33% average for the night. They were already at 60 for their touchdown percentage. So only one in three trips against the Gator defense. Good to see. No surprises in UCF being able to score touchdowns in the red zone. You did your job. So I just had to start there. uh, Because we've harped on bad defense, bad defense, bad defense. And who knows, as I said, what this means big picture. I do think they figured some things out to be better. Where on the ladder is better when the schedule gets harder, of course. I mean, you see, it's not a great team by any means. They're not. But at the same time, everything coming into this game, everything they could do on offense, their style of play on offense, it could have eaten this defense up if they didn't fix some things, if they weren't ready to play. They did both those things. I think they fixed some things. I think they are better. How much better still remains to be seen. But for Saturday night, been a lot of what we wanted them to see. So I had to start there. That was the story of the game. You know, we criticize and critique when it doesn't look good. Well, when it looks as good as it did Saturday night, praise is absolutely needed. And we are going to start there because it was the story of the game. We knew if Florida was going to probably win or lose this game, it was going to be what they do on defense against this UCF team. Because we felt pretty comfortable that Florida could score on UCF and still thought it would be more than 24 points. You got kind of comfortable. Uh, I, I'm not going to – even Billy Napier said it in, in the post game. It, I don't think it was as simple as uh, they just let up, let, let up on the gas pedal. No, the execution was pretty lacking. But I thought Florida would score more. But the game was already ever in doubt. But you knew the story going to game. If Florida couldn't stop them on defense, more than likely not going to win the game. Florida stopped them. Get her defense showed up. Most of the thought was going to be you know, really, really simple. As simple as just limiting the UCF ground attack. And Florida did just that. Didn't give up easy explosive plays. Held a bad red zone offense to being a bad red zone offense. And you win the game. Check with some comments here. Before uh, we'll go to the little game summary right quick. Matt Green said the game was good. Second half, we slacked, but first half was amazing. It was a good, it was a good environment. It, it really was. Um, as you said, second half, ho-hum. But uh, it, it was still uh, night game in the swamp. LED lights going crazy. The fireworks won't back down. was pretty, pretty, pretty darn good. Video of it on Twitter. Some great pictures by Alex Shepard as well that he took. I shared one of uh, Montreal Johnson touchdown. The blue LED lights are on, but you see the orange fireworks in the background. Great photo. Go check it out on Twitter. Um, Adam says, second half, Napier went ultra-conservative mode. UCF just held on to the ball the whole half. Yeah, time of possession was a, a big part of that, too. Not many possessions. Um, yeah, rushing yards. And that's where I go with the execution. And we'll get into the stats in just a bit. I think Florida averaged a whole yard less rushing the ball uh, in the second half. So, uh, Matt Wolf, take the win. Not much to take from this win. UCF is the Midland Big 12 team. By the end of this year, they will have five, six losses. Yeah, maybe. Probably so. Um, I said, I'll enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, it doesn't mean Florida's going to go beat Tennessee. Doesn't mean Florida's going to beat Kentucky. Certainly doesn't mean all that, but like I said a couple weeks ago with Mississippi State, well, at least we know we're not that bad. (laughs) And look, UCF was chirping. Their fan base chirping a lot. They were ready for this game. They were ready to come into the swamp and win. They had a pretty good showing for fan base uh, support uh, as well. Not as many as I think they were going, you know, they were trying to lead to believe that they were going to try and take over the swamp, and it wasn't anything close to that. Um, you know, but they were they were loud early, but uh didn't last long. Uh, Muddy Waters, just when you think, man, Billy is showing emotion and we're dominating, then the second half happens and Mr. Conservative, like the Tennessee game, comes out. This is one of the billion reasons he's gone. 
Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people brought that Tennessee game up last year, uh, where you had um, and look that that first half was even better than the uh, UCF first half, uh, the Tennessee game last year, uh, and yeah, certainly, um, you know, that's probably why there were so many one score games at Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, you go back and look at it, and uh, some one, you know, a lot of one score wins, uh, not really pulling away from teams. Uh, maybe even you know, I don't know the. I don't remember the whole history of Billy Napier at Louisiana, but maybe teams coming back um, like that, you know, getting a lead and just kind of going conservative mode. Uh, but you know, I, I got to see something. You know, of, of course, only watch the game from the press box and maybe in a replay can maybe see more of you know what the difference was in the second half. Um, so we'll see. So it all means any, but yeah, yeah, we will get into it in here in just a game summary a bit, but uh, an emotional. Uh, Billy Napier for sure. Uh, okay, I'll come back to the comments here. Uh, but let's start the game and let's remember. Uh, and I put it out pretty early on Saturday. Uh, I heard pretty early on that Trey Wilson was likely not to go. And I know he tried to give it a go uh, in the warm ups and stuff. So he, he went through warm ups and everything, but uh, decided, uh, Florida decided best not to play uh, a Trey Wilson. But Pretty big storyline there because no Trey Wilson, but also at the receiver position, no Aiden Mizell, no Marcus Burke. Marcus Burke uh, was hurt in pregame. Uh, it sounds like Billy Napier said in, in the postgame. So um, wide receiver position a little thin going into this game against UCF. Uh, but then Trey on Webb as well at running back uh, did not play. So we'll count more on Elijah Badger, Chimere DK. And Tank Hawkins gets more involved as we go through here. So, uh, first drive, of course, Florida gets the ball first. Graham Mertz, starting quarterback there for the Gators. They have the rotation again. Uh, and on the first drive, they get to a third and five. Uh, they're on 30. So, you get Badger for 10. That's a first down. Uh, then a gain of six. So you start seeing Tank Hawkins early on. A gain of six for a first down to Tank. Then another screen to Tank for a third and one near midfield. Uh, and then Montreal Johnson for the first down to the UCF 36. Now, second and 10, Montreal check down. A lot of check downs <laughs> here from Graham Mertz uh, in this game. But uh, the second and 10, check down. He makes a man miss. Uh, probably shouldn't have been what it was, but that sets up a third and three. Uh, and barely get it. You know, it's at the 29, and Florida motions a guy in. And that ends up bringing another guy into the box. It ends up like a seven-man box there for Florida. Uh, barely get the first down. Um uh, Florida continuing on, though, another third down. Sets up a third and four, uh, as a, a Jaden Ball run did with a six-yard gain. Then there's an empty set, quick pass to Hayden Hansen for the first down to the 13. And then the very next play, first touchdown of the game, wide open play action to Elijah Badger in the end zone. For the touchdown, nobody near him <laughs> as he went clear across the field from the right side of the formation all the way to the left, uh, wide open. Guys, Gators scored on their f- opening possession for the first time this season. First time all season. The opening drive goes for a score. 15 plays, 75 yards, almost eight minutes on that drive. 7 nothing Gators, 4-4 four, four on third down. UCF gets the ball, their first play, running back screen. It goes for 30 yards. So you're like, okay. <laughs> all this talk about defense and... um Pretty aggressive mindset there for Florida. Look, I love screen plays that early in the game because you know the defense is just amped up. Uh, but uh, there you go. UCF running back screen goes for 30 yards down to the Florida 45. And then that gets to a third and three at the 38. And a sweep goes for four, so first down UCF. A couple of runs later, UCF gets another first down to the 25. So they're driving. They're driving on the first drive of the game. Uh, another first down a couple of runs later to the 13. It gets to a third and seven from the 10. The pass to the end zone goes incomplete. You know, so the combination of KJ Jefferson and some good coverage by Florida throughout the game uh, really limited the UCF passing attack. Uh, I think Florida's defenders played pretty well uh, in, in the secondary, but KJ Jefferson is, as we know, not the most accurate of quarterbacks. Uh, but that pass to the end zone goes incomplete, and you started seeing it from here on or from the start, from UCF's first drive of the game. The red zone issues were going going to be there. They continued. Field goal UCF, 7-3 Gators. Bryce Thornton making some good plays there early in the game. So 
I'm hearing from some guys we, you know, haven't heard a whole lot from this year. And, you know, of course, injuries have played a part on, on defense at, at times this year. Uh, but also, you know, with that bye week, there was some realization of some good, different guys need to play. Bryce Thornton, a guy we haven't heard a whole lot of this year, making plays early on. Florida gets the ball back. That gets to a third and eight after a false start as UCF brings pressure uh, as a check down to Montreal. A loss of one punt from the goal line. UCF fair catch their own 34. So nothing going uh, there for Florida's second drive. Would have loved to see, you know, step on the throat more early on instead of a three and out. Uh, but we all know how it worked out. But still, you know, revisionist history, we can say it and say, okay, didn't really matter in the end. But still, you had a 7 3. Could have went up a couple scores right there. Um, but oh well. Uh, already in the second quarter, uh, as far as UCF gets the ball, Castell comes as a missile. Uh, great to see him in that attacking mode. Uh, we haven't seen it a whole lot this year from the safety spot. Um, a missile, a missile tackle on second down for a gain of four. So that sets up a third and one for UCF at their own 43. Tyreek Sapp, Sharif Denson with the tackle for no gain. So it's up a fourth and one for UCF. They're on 43. They go for it. Caleb Banks, Pup Howard, George Gums make the stop as Jefferson runs for no gain. Gators take over at the UCF 43. So that's when you could, you know, as I said, the first drive, they drove down, had to settle for a field goal. But then that second drive, you could, as your first time seeing this Gator defense up front, short yardage situations. We're going to be a force to be reckoned with throughout the night. Lagway comes in, his first drive of the game. On second down, finds DK for 37 down to the goal line with just a laser. I mean, that's impressive throw uh, there for DJ Lagway. Only he four for four for the game, so this was the biggest by far uh, of his plays. Uh, would like to see more of him, but of course, you know, limited possessions here in, in this game. Uh, but that throw was, that's what I just want to see more of. <laughs> that's what DJ Lagway gives you at the quarterback spot. But just a rope down to DK to the goal line. Jacoby Jackson takes it in on the very next play. 14-3 to three Gators. Um, DJ Lagway and Mertz combined to go 9 of 10 for 91 yards and one touchdown uh, across the, the first three drives. Uh, almost a touchdown for, for Lagway to DK. Uh, but certainly led to another score for the Gators. But the quarterbacks, 9 of 10 for 91 yards on the first three drives. UCF, of course, gets the ball, takes over at their own 24. They have a reverse that goes nowhere on first down, a tackle for loss by Aaron Gates. So another player, <laughs> that's your Bryce Thornton, Gates. You had some DBs here, young DBs, playing well for Florida early on. Gets to a third and two from the 32, and another stuff for the Gators' defense. UCF has got a punt. Gators take over at their own 22. First down, Mertz has, uh, uh, has to scramble away from pressure, but he finds Badger for 18 yards. Later, a third and three at the Florida 47. Check down from Mertz to Montreal for a loss of three. Uh, that punt on the very next play by Jeremy Crawshaw checks up at the three-yard line. So, man, he's, uh, he's been putting the ball over special teams, not getting a whole lot of love conversation-wise. But, man, um, cross all what he's done this year has been uh, pretty exceptional there for for, for, for the punter. So um, another one here with a punt that just, boom, checks up right there at the three-yard line. So UCF, deep start in their own territory, of course. K.J. Jefferson avoids a sack in the end zone. Looks like it was about to be a safety for the Gators. Throws up uh, the ball to Trent Winnemore for 28 yards, the former Gator, of course, um, to the 31-yard line. 28-yard game to the 31. Sets up a third and eight at the 33. Florida brings R.J. Moten in for a pressure, so he, Tyreek Sapp, get the sack back to the 24. Tyreek Sapp showing up early on uh, in this game as well. He'd be forced to be working with uh, for the Gator defense, but nice to see that aggression uh, and, and aggression pay off. Uh, how many times have we seen Florida bring pressure this year only for it not to get there, only for the quarterback to make a play anyway? or escape escape the pressure, or just get rid of it just in time, or it just take forever to get there. Not Saturday night. R.J. Moten, Tyreek Sapp, get the sack back to the 24. Florida gets the ball back. Uh, you know, just from, from there, because it, a lot of it causes the defense, because the fan base has just been waiting, waiting to, 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 to 
have something to cheer for for this Florida defense. It, you know, that, that's when you're you, that's when you can be so loud. That's when you can have a whole lot of fun in the swamp and, and you're yelling as loud as you can, and then they give you something to keep cheering for. So the swamp's into it uh, right here. 14-3. Florida's getting the ball back with 540 left. How many times have we wanted to see this from a Florida offense? I mean, there's 540 left. We want to see points being scored late. Late in the half, early in the next, uh, early in the second half. So here, here's your chance. You know, 540 left in the first half. First and 10 Gators at their own 42 after UCF punt. Mertz is back in at quarterback. Second 10, Mertz finds Tank. UCF brings a ton of pressure, finds Tank for 31, down to the 27 for UCF. Third and 10 for Florida, had an ineligible man down the field. So third and 15 from the UCF 32. Get the five yards back after offsides on UCF. So back to third and 10 from the 27. Empty set. Mertz finds DK for a gain of 20. A catch and run after a broken tackle. Very next play, Mertz throws to DK as he rolls right. Pass falls incomplete, but roughing the passer on UCF. Now first and goal at the three for Florida. Montreal Johnson breaks tackle, leaps his way, stretches into the end zone. 21-3 Gators. A minute 50 left in the first half. So you just knew at this point, it's 21-3. If the defense was going to keep playing like they were, this game was pretty essentially over. Now, weird to say for this Florida team and the struggles we have seen this year, but still, you're like, okay, just keep this defensive performance up. We got this one in the bag. UCF takes over at their own 25, third and four at the 31. It falls incomplete. But then you get a running into the kicker on Caleb Banks. Gives UCF a first down. Billy Napier goes crazy. Good to see. I know many, many of you out there on social media, on Gators Breakdown Plus Discord, lauding the emotion Billy Napier is showing there. He gets an unsportsmanlike. So UCF gets the ball near midfield. Napier's fired up. Uh, so uh, just I know a lot of generations have been wanting to see it. UCF goes for a deep, deep pass. That's incomplete. Marshall swats it away. Jefferson then finds Hudson. Eventually, it's a third and nine at the 34. Pass nowhere close. UCF stays on the field for a fourth and nine from the 34. And guess what? Jefferson sacked at midfield. A host of Gators back there. And that was a good thing about you know some of these pressures and some of these sacks. Is it wasn't just one guy. I mean, there were a host of Gators on these sacks, on these tackles for loss. This one. Justice Boone, TJ Searcy, George Gums, all back there getting a sack at midfield as you know, UCF's trying to press, trying to get a score before halftime. They get the ball first after halftime. So trying to get the two for one there. They were aggressive. Florida on defense aggressive as well. Lagway comes in first and 15 at the 39 after legal formation. Only 43 seconds left. Uh, but of course, you know, Napier has some timeout, gets a little aggressive here. Eventually get to a second 10 at the Florida 44. Montreal runs for 34 yards to the UCF 22. 21 seconds left in the first half. Lagway runs for three to the 19. There's your timeout. 17 seconds left. Lagway finds Montreal for nine for the first down to the 10-yard line with nine seconds left. Then a spike that leaves seven seconds on the clock. And then Florida already decides to kick a field goal to go up 24-3. Um, now, you, you called the timeout. I did think going in right there, probably enough time for one more play. Um, they just decided to go ahead and kick the field goal. I thought, uh, thought there would have been enough time for one more play. Um, so that was a kind of a catch-22 in, in, in a whole lot of ways. You, you, you call the timeout. But you know, kind of get conservative there with, with some a little bit of time on the clock. So that was kind of that was, the way it played out was just kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, 24 3. It's halftime. Florida 251 to 119 yard edge over UCF. Florida 79 yards rushing. UCF 29 yards rushing. Florida 4.6 yards per rush. UCF 1.6. That's how you kind of knew the game was. Pretty in hand for Florida. 172 passing yards for Florida, 90 for UCF. Yards after the catch, 103 
for the Gators, 46 for UCF in the first half. Florida had 37 plays to UCF 31. Florida 6.8 yards per play, UCF 3.8 yards per play. So Florida averaging three more yards per play. Time of possession, 1908 for the Gators. Make sure. I think that was I think that was right. Yeah. Uh 1908 to 1048 for UCF. And perhaps the most important, on third down. Florida was five of seven on third down. UCF one of seven in the first half. All right, second half won't take long. <laughs> As we know, what wasn't much going on there. Um UCF gets the ball first. Third one at their own 46 on their first drive. Uh, wide receiver motion, sweep to the left for four. That's a first down to the 50 for UCF. Third and five at the Florida 45. UCF run for seven. So first down to the 38. So UCF driving their first drive after halftime. You could tell they wanted to establish the run earlier. They're eating a whole lot of clock here, a whole lot of time here, though. Um, they're just running it. Uh, they don't even, not even trying to pass it. Trying to see if they could get the back in to that game that way. But they were just, that second half, Gus was kind of clock management, time management, game management was not the best. Ended up helping Florida. But they're just running it. They had another gain of 17 and then 11 to the 10. First and goal from the 10. That turns into third and goal from the 9. He had to delay a game by UCF. So it was third and goal from the 14, and Pup Howard with the sack on K.J. Jefferson. There was two plays in a row there from Pup Howard. Red zone issue strike again for UCF. They have to settle up for a field goal, 24-6 Gators. Florida gets the ball, third and four from the 31. Mertz scrambles a yard short. Fourth and one from the 34. Mertz on the option keeper for four yards. I, I like that play. Uh, pretty literally thought uh, I was first of all surprised Florida was actually going for it in that situation uh, and then love the call with with Mertz and the option keeper there uh, next play finds DK for 24 to the UCF 38 so Florida driving here he had second and one I mean this is where Florida just kind of steps on their foot a bit he had second and one from the UCF 29 had great you know great time to take a shot there but no, nothing there there was, um, and I had it written down. Now that they said that Florida didn't give up any sacks, but I have to go back and look because I remember it was second and one. They had a chance, had a chance there, but it ends up it's the second eleven at the at the thirty nine. Um, pretty sure it's uh, probably holding there. So you hand out, yeah. So Florida didn't give up uh, the sack, but got called for holding. Hand off to J Johnson. He gets tackled from a blitzing defender for a loss of one. And you get third and 12 from the 40. So you go from second one at UCF 29 to third and 12 from the 40. You had a wasted opportunity there. Had to settle for a 53-yard field goal that was missed. So that, you had something going in the second half. Then after that, not much. Uh, UCF at their own 35. They take over. Sack on first and 15 at the UCF 47. LJ McCray, DeAndre Robinson. Freshman making plays. That sets up a third and 23. George Gums Jr. sacks Jefferson. UCF forced to punt. And, you know, as soon as UCF had to pass, pass rush overwhelmed them. And that's what you want to see. And Billy Dayford talked all week about getting them getting in those situations, and then taking advantage of those situations. Florida put UCF in the situation and showed up. couple sacks on one drive. So Florida takes over their own 22, uh, really only get a 12-yard pass from, uh, to Hawkins from Mertz uh, on the first play, then have to punt. UCF takes over their own 18, down 24-6, 11-25 left in the game already. Uh, big play, second and nine as Jefferson finds Harvey on the wheel route for 35. Uh, to the Florida 46. UCF eventually gets to first and 10 at the 25. Cam Jackson gets a tackle for loss for two yards. Second and 12 from the 27. Another wheel route. Shamar James called for pass interference. Ball for UCF at the 13. First and 10. Harvey runs for the touchdown from 13 yards out. 24-13 Florida. 7.50 left in the game. 
I did notice on that drive, UCF scored a touchdown. Uh, of course, aided by penalties, they were passing the ball a bit more, but no Pup Howard on that drive. After the previous drive, he dominates. And your best defender is not on the field. Oh, the rotations kind of question me sometimes. Uh, so not going to say their touchdown happened because Pup was off the field, but still just noteworthy that it happens that way. Party gets the ball back. Second six from the 29 on this drive. Jackson runs for 19 yards to the Florida 48. Big play there. Next play is a three-yard loss on the screen to Hawkins as he fumbles and has to recover. Second and 13 from her own 45. Lagway on a keeper to the right. You see a defender gets called for targeting, but that's reversed. Not sure how. Um, false start on Florida the next play. So you get to third and 15 from your own 43. Tunnel screen to DK only gets seven. Florida offense not doing anything in the second half in three drives. Have to punt the ball to UCF with 420 left in the game to their own 14. Uh, kind of just aggravating. You know, the, the, the penalties really hurt Florida. Um, just really couldn't get in a groove at all on very limited possessions in the second half. Gets the third down and four for UCF at their own 20. They run it for five. There's 2.30 left. As I said, they're kind of just playing in the Florida's hands here. Gus, time management, they're still just running it. They have a first down at their own 35. Uh, that's 2.03 at the snap. Pass is incomplete. Two-minute timeout with 156 left. Game's pretty much over at this point. They're just playing in the Florida's hands. Second 10, Jefferson launches one deep. It's interception by Bryce Thornton at the Florida 21. First of his career. Gators take over, 148 left. That is pretty much the game as a couple runs seal it. So pretty good game summary right there. 24-13 win for the Gators. Let's pull up some stats. 359-273 overall total yard comparison there. 359 for the Gators. 273 for UCF. 130 rushing yards for the Gators. 108 for UCF. Gators with 32 rushing attempts, 4.1 yards a rush. UCF, 40 rushing attempts, 2.7 yards per rush. 2.7 yards per rush. That's what Florida needed to do to win the game. 229 passing yards for Florida, 165 for UCF. One more time. 273 total yards for UCF. Great, great job for the Gator defense. Yard per completion, only 10 for the Gators on 23 of 28 passing, 13.8 yards per completion for UCF, 12 of 22, 55% completion percentage. Red zone attempts, story of the game, or a story of the game. Mention, one more time, how putrid UCF's red zone offense is. Three for three in the red zone, but they had a set up for two field goals. Gators, four of four in their red zone attempts, 24 points off those. Pretty much uh, all the points came from the red zone. No explosive plays ending in touchdowns. All the scoring from the red zone. As I said, the lag way to DK gets you down to the one. About as close as you got. Gators 6 of 13 on third down. UCF 4 of 12 on third down. Skater defense, third down defense. and Not great this season. Taking advantage of UCF. So UCF was 4 of 12 on third down, 0 of 2 on fourth down. So we'll combine 4 of 14 on the conversion downs. UCF with 6 penalties for 39 yards, Florida 8 penalties, 64 yards. On defense, 74 tackles for the Gators, 55 for UCF. Tackles for loss, 7. 7 tackles for loss for the Gators. 5 sacks. We got more about that in just a second, but there you go. Uh, for Florida, nineteen to twenty-three for Graham Mertz, one hundred seventy-nine yards, one touchdown pass, four of four for DJ Lagway, four of four for fifty yards. Tate Hawkins leads the day at receiving seven catches, sixty yards, along with thirty-one. Love seeing him out there, but man, it was just not, not hardly anything down the field, and not not him. It's just 
and he pretty much took the 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 Trey Wilson snaps here. So much still close to the line of scrimmage. Montreal Johnson with a lot of checkdowns, <laughs> six catches for 24 yards. As I said, a lot of checkdowns in this game. No surprise where we're at now. You know, just not going to push the ball down the field. Part of, I think, what we saw from the offense in the second half. Just not an offense that's going to push the ball down the field with Graham Mertz at quarterback. Um, now, granted, it's still overall better than taking those shots and not hitting them because we saw that with the Miami game. I think that that was the best example of, I right, just play within the offense. Lagway's out there. I don't think it's that predictable. I mean, I think defenses know they'll have to prepare more for the deep shots. But with Mertz out there, it's just going to be a safe approach on offense. Chibre DK, four catches, 88 yards, along with 37. Elijah Badger, Elijah Badger, three for 41 in the touchdown. Thank, thankfully, you got those two guys out of the transfer portal. Now, granted, you have no idea how this plays out, but given what Florida had as far as injuries go with Trey Wilson, Marcus Burke, Aiden Mazel, thankfully, you can still turn to Chimre Dike and Elijah Badger, who have just been absolute, just so integral in this passing game. I won't know where Florida's receiver room would be, would be without those two guys. I think we've liked what we've seen from the other guys, too. But those guys, being on the field with these guys together makes this whole room better. And Chimay DK, I think, I think overall, is probably showing a bit more than I think the expectation was. And Elijah Badger is about what I expected. Now, DK, you were hearing throughout spring and you were hearing throughout fall camp that this is the type of player he can be. And I think probably got graded too harshly on a down year last year when Wisconsin brings in a new staff. But we all saw what he did a couple years ago with Graham Mertz. And we're getting a lot of that. And Elijah Badger still is just the, the physical presence at receiver that we absolutely need. Hayden Hansen, two for 13. Boardingham, one for three. Not a, not, not a big night for the tight ends. But 23 receptions overall for 229 yards in the one touchdown. Uh, not a whole lot in the rushing game either for the Gators. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody else brought it up on Twitter too before I get into the rushing attack. It's just lets you know the the limitations for Florida's passing attack when you can go twenty three or twenty eight. You know, it's two hundred twenty nine yards, not not a ton of yardage, but it only win twenty four thirteen. Yeah, that's uh, just a, <laughs> it might be a just a, a byproduct of the style of offense. Uh, you can have a pretty safe day from the quarterbacks and only scored 24 points. Um, but enough to win. Enough to win this one. Rushing, not much there. Montreal Johnson, 10 for 54 and one touchdown. 5.4 5, 5. yards of carry. Jane Ball, 9 for 30. Jacoby Jackson, 3 for 25. A touchdown as well. DJ Lagway, 3 for 11. Mertz, 3 for 11. And Tank Hawkins, 1 for 4. Florida defense led by Shamar James, Jordan Castell, both with six tackles. Moten, five tackles. Had the half sack, of course. Jaden Robinson, who we're kind of talking about, who does Florida need to put on the field more? Well, he was out there producing. Jack Pyburn, a lot of publicity this week. Getting his chance, coming back from injury, him being on the field. One more time, a five-tackle performance for him. Tyreek sat with five as well. So Robinson, Pyburn, Sapp, all with five. Tyreek Sapp, half a sack, half a tackle for loss. Jason Marshall, Grayson Howard, Cam Jackson, all with four. Grayson, of course, with the one sack, one tackle for loss. Pretty good day for the defense. Active up front. George Gums. The thing about him, you know, it's been Sanford and it's been UCF. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to take some unnecessary shot at UCF here. You know, big difference between UCF and Sanford. But 
You know, it's been the you know two of the easier teams on the schedule. I like. I like the potential of George Gunn. He shows it in these games. Can we see it? You know, in SEC play. Can we see it on the tougher teams on the schedule? When I mean, you can see here, there, 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 there's a baseline here for George Gums. Two total tackles, but one and a half for loss, or one and a half sack, one and a half for loss. So I, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to see it. You know, take the next step. I, I think. I think there's something there. But can we see it translate into the more bigger, tougher opponents in SEC play that are coming up? Okay, there we go. Keep it going here. Um, let's compare, compare the first and second half. I mean, that, that's the one of the bigger storylines here, of course, for for Florida in this game. Twenty four three in the first half. Florida was going to win 24-13. Florida had 251 total yards in the first half, 108 in the second half. Had 51 rushing yards in the second half compared to 79 in the first half. 3.4 yards of rush in the second half, 4.6 in the first. 16 of 20 passing in the first half, 7 of 8 <laughs> in the second half, So, but just not a lot of yardage. 172 in the first half, 57 passing in the second half. So, you know, there was your comparison. It, it was really the third downs. You know, Florida just couldn't stay on the field. As I said, they shot themselves in the foot uh, a, a good bit, but Florida was five of seven on third downs in the first half, one of six in the second half. So it was, I, I think it was a myriad of issues. I think it kind of was conservative. Also, at the same time, you just hurt yourself. Um, that really wasn't the, the the execution wasn't there. I think that, that bears out in a lot of the you know almost a whole yard less rushing per attempt. But uh, second uh, second half, we'll watch a little a little more. I think I'm going to watch for in a replay is were some more of the deep shots there for Graham Mertz and just not pulling the trigger. Were there guys open down the field and were there UCF adjustments to what Florida was doing in the second half? Was it more to do with the UCF defense? But as we kind of laid out here in the game summary, you know Florida was killing themselves for penalties. I mean, the first drive of the second half, you're marching, marching down, had second and one only to not get anything out of it. Second one at the 29 and not get anything out of it. Time of possession in the first half, 1908, 1308 in the second half. Uh, let's see. JP Gator on Gators Breakdown Plus. I want to point this out. He had a shout out to the defense. Lowest offensive yards for UCF in the game since the 2018 bowl game against LSU. Uh, remember that. You know, of course, um, LSU comes into the swamp that year. Joe Burrow, his first year at LSU. UCF and LSU play in a bowl game the year after UCF wants to proclaim themselves national champions. Uh, they played in a Peach Bowl, I think it was. No, no, Florida played in Peach Bowl in 18. Um, but anyway, lowest. Output for a, a UCF offense since the 2018 bowl game against LSU. JP Gator also says tied for the lowest point scored in the Gus era for UCF and third lowest rushing yardage total of the Gus era. So there you go. That's the type of performance Florida put together Saturday night in the swamp. Now keep it going from uh, Florida here. They sent some notes here. Florida registered a season high five sacks. In Saturday's win over UCF, while not allowing a single sack on offense, Gators held the Knights to 28.6% success rate on conversion downs. That's third and fourth downs, 28.6%, 414, as I mentioned. Tyreek Sapp, RJ Moten, they had a second quarter sack. Justice Boone, George Gums Jr. teamed up for a second quarter sack. Grayson Howard, his first career sack. That was Florida's third of the game. And then, this is the one that should really stand out, or it should be noteworthy in that group. DeAndre Robinson, defensive lineman, Edge L.J. McCray, they got Florida's fourth sack, half sacks, but first for their careers. Those freshmen making plays. DeAndre Robinson, L.J. McCray, stepping up there for the Gator defense. So, and it's just, man, it's just, 
I don't want to overlook that defensive performance. Um, granted, I know a lot of the storyline is about the offense too, but just love what I saw on that side of the ball finally. And just some talk kind of it, 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 it actually showing up. All right, let's get to some comments here. Roll the next. Uh, say it, Dave. The coaching shut it down thinking they should run out the clock. Uh, I mean, probably. Um, but like I said, I, I, I do what it's hard to catch everything in the press box. <laughs> I'm trying to take notes at the same time uh, in the first. So a replay, I think, will, will show more. Uh, but probably. Some, uh, you know, a lot to do with that. Uh, JB does bring up a good point. Jefferson didn't look nearly as athletic as he did last year. No, he did. He didn't. Um, but still, and granted, I, ma- I made sure to point this out in the preview as well. UCF schedule has not been the greatest. They had the two early cupcakes. Then it took like a miraculous comeback to beat TCU, and then slammed by Colorado. Um, so he looked good up to that point. It was a, a, a so-so game against Colorado. So his last two games, you're, you're right, have not been the best. But I do think at the same time, you're, you're right. Overall, he does not look as athletic as he did at Arkansas. All uh, right, Dwayne, I'm not, not sure how in-depth you want to get here, but what changed on defense? To me, it just starts up front. I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the coverage was good as well. There was a lot of good coverage in this game with an inaccurate K.J. Jefferson, but just to me, just straight up doing what you're supposed to do. That's what I said in in the preview. In the trenches, if you're Florida, and that's UCF, Saturday night was what what is supposed to happen. It doesn't mean it will happen. You know, if Florida's not Florida, and Florida's not Florida, but at the same time, there's still, and I've, I've maintained this, there's enough talent for Florida to be better than what they have shown. Not championship level. Nobody ever says it is. And it's not the expectation. But you should have been able to out talent UCF. And to me, that's what we saw. And, I, and that, that's another reason I, I'm glad to see it. Have your talent play like the talent. Have your talent play like the opponent's talent. And that's exactly what happened. Florida just, Florida just beat them up front, plain and simple. Uh, Matt says, Dave, any info on Mizell? Uh, he, he's hurt. He's injured. Uh, so that's that's a, all there is to that one. Uh, I don't think it's too serious. But I'll see if I can get some more on that. But Napier, you can already tell in post-game press conferences and stuff, really taking advantage of this uh, SEC injury rule. He's not going to talk about injuries hardly much at all anymore. <laughs> so... Uh, JB says, how bad is UCF's defense? Um, we caught quit last week. I, th- I would have loved for Florida to be able to, and, and, and I think that's why I, I do think Florida could have. Now, don't get me wrong; we just went through all the all the bodies that Florida was missing at receiver. Would have loved to take an advantage in the passing game a bit more. So, I do think the twenty four to three lead at halftime played into it. Who you had available, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to I'd like to have the game reps in that situation. You know, step on their throats. And I think we know by now that's not necessarily Billy Napier, but would have just loved to see a more clean second half. Uh, I don't think they were ever going to be ultra aggressive in the second half in the first place with a 24 to 3 lead, but a little more and just a cleaner operation. Okay, let's see. Thanks for hopping in here, guys. Oh, man, late night, though. Um, Let's see. I think I got home enough to watch the final Miami drive against Cal. I was listening to it on the way back to Jacksonville. By the time that got over with and settled down, I think I finally laid down at like 3.30 in the morning. Back up at like 8, 
trying to get ready for the podcast episode here. <laughs> so not the not a whole lot of sleep. Uh, Scott Anderson brings up, is Napier still in the hot seat if they beat Tennessee? Uh, yeah, but it's a lot less, it's a lot cooler. I think, um, but, you know, certainly have to see how the rest of the season plays out. You know, as we, it, Neil and I, Neil Blackman and I, you know, last, about a week ago, we kind of laid out the process for Billy Napier keeping his job. And I still think, you know, the, a lot of the administration wants to keep him. If he, at, but now at the point he's got to prove something. A win against Central Florida was going to be the first step of that, and then now you're going to have to get some upset wins along the way. I think we all know that. If Philly Napier wants to save his job, there's going to have to have to be some upsets. You know, minus Kentucky, minus whatever happens at Florida State at the end of the year. But whether it be Tennessee, whether it be Georgia, whether it be ten, uh, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss. His path to saving his job is getting upset wins and not just one. So that's why I say he's still in the hot seat because it's going to take more than just Tennessee. It's going to take a Georgia, a Texas, a LSU, an Ole Miss win to get rid of that as well. I think he's going to have to get like seven wins. And that means you're going to have to go beat a few of these teams you have left on the schedule that many people aren't going to see as close competitions right now. So, yeah, I think he's still... It will cool it. Don't get me wrong. But he'd, st- he'd still be on the hot seat. But yeah, I mean, that, that game certainly looks a little different now. Uh, I know a lot of people were kind of jumping on that, hey, it's a dangerous trip to go to Arkansas and play. And it turned out to be that way. Um, like I've been high, I'm pretty high on Tennessee. Certainly disappointing performance uh, for, for, for those guys. And it certainly... You do, you do wonder they had you know, the trip to Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago and then the bye week. And I think I heard a lot of Tennessee players, I forgot who said it, saying that maybe they were kind of caught up in reading their press clippings and you know, maybe thinking they maybe had already arrived at this point in the season. Well, they got a wake-up call against Arkansas. Now, what do they do with that wake-up call? Is that who more Tennessee really is? Is it go, now going to be pure focus and take it out on Florida next weekend, somewhere in between? It's pure guess as to where that goes. I think in a lot of ways it probably opens their eyes, but maybe, maybe they're not as good as they look. They look, it was a bad, it was a bad day for a lot of good teams on Saturday. So many top 10 upsets. I mean, Vandy and Bama, I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, so good teams can have bad days, but bad days yesterday meant losses. A lot of times you can play your you can play your worst game if you're a top ten team and still win. And a lot of times that happens against teams like Vanderbilt. You can play a bad game and still walk out with a victory. Maybe not this year, Vanderbilt. Maybe you've got to play a good game against Vanderbilt to to, to walk out with a win. They beat Virginia Tech earlier in the year and then lost to Georgia State. <laughs> so they're they're a roller coaster of a team right now. But good teams are losing games. Saw what Ole Miss last week at Kentucky. So the last two weeks have given us some pretty good examples of teams we think are pretty good having bad days. What did they do? Ole Miss bounced back. Ole Miss went to Columbia, went to South Carolina, and just waxed, waxed South Carolina. Does Tennessee kind of do the same thing? That, 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 that's probably my storyline of that game. Is Tennessee like an Ole Miss? And they learn. And they'll, they'll be at home. Ole Miss had to go on the road. So different circumstances there. And we know Tennessee is circling this game. We know they have years of frustration that are going to be built up for a Florida team that comes to a night game in Knoxville. Are they going to be more like Ole Miss, or is Tennessee about what they showed against Arkansas? Because we got some Tennessee schedule up to this point. NC State was a game circled, supposed to be a surprise team in the ACC, maybe an underrated team in the ACC. Tennessee waxes them, and then we come to find out NC State's just not a very good team. Oklahoma doesn't have an offense. 
I think Tennessee played pretty conservative in that game. And then they lose to Arkansas. So I think there's a there there legitimately there's a lot of questions about where Tennessee is now. I was putting them up with Bama and Georgia and Texas last week. And now <laughs> who knows? <laughs> maybe maybe Texas is the class of the SEC right now. Georgia loses to Bama. Bama goes on to get beat by Vandy. And then we saw what happened to Tennessee. Now it's kind of Texas is there by themselves. Interesting season. Interesting season so far. Big Gator fan says, I think we can beat Tennessee. I mean, I sort of think it's more possible now than I thought it was. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell any spoiler alert. I'm not, I'm not going to pick Florida this week. But how many times have we went to Knoxville, not really being expected to win, and Florida comes out of that stadium with a win anyway? So there's a couple of angles to this. <laughs> Maybe Tennessee not being as good. and been some times where Florida probably shouldn't have won that game, but finds a way to win it anyway. Okay, Muddy, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, Mertz was sacked. You're right. So I, I remember typing it. That I guess I didn't go back and, but then I re- kind of remembered in my head that it was a hold call there. So, um, so technically, Mertz would have been sacked, but hey, still counts in the uh, stat column as, as, as not a sack. Uh, there, so uh, probably should point that out too. Good performance for the offensive line. I mean, I think in the in the parts where we've had our most concerns about the skater team, last couple of games, offensive line has looked better. Certainly, I mean, the rushing attack still nowhere near where we want it to be. The Billy Napier offense, uh, but they have protected better. Now, Mississippi State, UCF, nowhere near. The defenses we're about to we're about to see nowhere near it. I right now, if you ask me, I'd take a performance because we we know the bottom. We we know we saw Miami, we saw Texas A and M, and we've seen the last couple of games. At this moment, I'd probably take somewhere in between. That means it's probably still nowhere near where you want it. But you know, if it's as bad again as it was. But A and M in Miami, then it's not going to be pretty against Tennessee. It's not going to be pretty against Georgia. It's not going to be pretty against all these other teams coming up. But they have improved. And I asked Billy Napier about it last week, and you know, I played it on the uh, the the episode last week about you know they are getting more settled. They're trying to give some young guys some game reps too to help develop, but they are more settled up front. Is that paying off? So that group and the the defense, of course. So I think our two biggest concerns about this team so far. Offensive line and the defense as a whole. Against UCF, much better performances. And then Roland brought, brought up, yeah, I mean, saw D. Lyman chasing Mertz all night. I mean, yeah, there, I'm not going to say there weren't any pressures. I mean, they, they were playing better. You know, a sack number is only as good as what it is on the surface. That's why I want to watch a replay as well. Um, Mertz would hang on to the beat. It's, I think a lot of that, too, is Mertz just not getting rid of the ball on that first read. And that's what I want to go back and look. Is it the first, he's not confident in this releasing the ball to that first read? Is the first read not open? So he'll go through his progressions, and I think that's allowing some more pressure, you know, allowing more time for this defensive lineman to get to him. So I just think something I certainly want to look for, and I don't want to laud this offensive line as turning the corner yet. But kind of going back to the you know last couple topic conversations here with the offensive line. I want to watch a replay there. Big Gator fan says, Florida played like they did last night, and I think they can beat Tennessee. Clean up a few things. Uh, certainly got to clean up a, a, a good bit. Um, I still think their defensive line versus Florida's offensive line, as we sit here a week away, that's going to be the that's going to be the matchup. Much like it was against Miami. That's the, that's the matchup. Um, and I think you're going to have to use Lagway to hit some big passes. Uh, this still might be a game. 
Maybe Tennessee's offense isn't as good as they will be or can be, but I still think Google has to score some points here. And I think you're gonna have to hit some explosives. You're not gonna drive. I don't. I don't think you're gonna drive on this Tennessee defense uh, many, many times. You're gonna have to have some explosives, or those gonna come from Lagway. All right, plenty of time for that game though. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Muddy, this was. I didn't see much. I didn't see it on the broadcast as much, but I was kind of maybe a little annoyed too. And I kind of pointed it out there. It was, did you see Lagway look annoyed uh, at Billy when there was eight seconds left before the half and Billy sent the field goal unit out? Yeah, to me, I, th- I thought there was enough for one more shot. Um, look at it. You called the timeout to – don't get me wrong. You called the timeout to get points, uh, to, 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 to save time, and you got a field goal out of it. But, uh, yeah, to me, I would have been a little more aggressive in that situation and at least try one shot at the end zone there. All right. Oh, what's up, guys? Victory Sunday for sure. Matthew, yep, yep, yep. Big hello. Victory Sunday. I saw somebody else. Uh, man, it was in it was in Discord. I got to get back to this. The coffee on Sunday morning just tastes better. Just tastes better. Tastes taste better after a win. Haven't had enough of those. Haven't had enough of the great tasting coffee on Sunday mornings. Last few have been pretty good. <laughs> a bye week and two wins. All right, good stuff, guys. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for, you know, I, I had no idea when I was going to go live. As I said, um, night games, man, so weird. You know, it's... There's not much of a bit. I could try to do one from the stadium before I leave, uh, but that just puts me like I would have been even further behind. So probably not getting home to like right at three and getting to bed at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> after driving to Jacksonville uh, after that. So uh, then then much not much benefit of getting home and then doing one and it's like a two o'clock live episode or whatever. So usually on night games, a home night game kind of hold off a bit. Because I don't think the live chat would be all that great at two, three o'clock in the morning. Now, if I'm wrong, you guys let me know. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think it would be. Uh, so it, more beneficial to probably hold off on Sunday. Uh, but not really sure what time I was going to get up. I had no alarm set, but go to bed at like three thirty. I was up at eight anyway. I was just kind of ready to get the kind of ready to talk to you guys. Kind of ready to talk about this game here. So. Thanks for, thanks for the short notice hopping in here. I mean, you guys know we're going to do an episode on Sunday. If it wasn't going to be on Saturday, but wasn't sure, you know, yeah, um, if you guys will be able to hop in or not. Uh, Nate says, yeah, I like the Sunday live chat sometimes. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, I, I like doing the live chat with, uh, with, with you guys for these game reviews uh, a bit. I think, it, I think it really adds something to it. Uh, everybody be safe this week, by the way. Uh, I saw somebody else point out um, the hurricane coming. Uh, I know we, the South, I know many of you who have, like me, I have family in Georgia, and my mom and dad still have no power. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, de- dealing with personal life stuff as well, like many of you are. And so another one coming this week, everybody, you know, it looks like just to say to Florida in this one as it going to go across the state. Uh, especially if you're in that in, in that mid central Florida, everybody certainly heed the warnings. Be safe. You know how dangerous these things can be now. Uh, we should know anyway, but it's on the fr- it's forefront of mind after Helene. Uh, so everybody, yeah, for real. Um, and uh, reach out if you guys need anything. I know a lot of people were out there hurting, suffering, Georgia, Carolinas. Uh, so hopefully, you know, not many of you guys are affected by that, but you know. Reach out, you know. I, I'll try to right here on Gators Breakdown keep your mind off of uh, off of those things. Uh, but uh, as we kind of want to do here, a distraction from real life a lot of times, and it's a lot easier to do, a lot easier to do when these Gators are winning. <laughs> so um, hopefully, some more of those to come. 
right here in the next few weeks. But all right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining me on this episode of Gators Breakdown.